Hi, uh, my name's Luke Sloan. Um, I'm um, a reader in the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University UK, and it's an absolute pleasure to be invited to do this. So thank you to Pieces and Sesda for putting this together. Um, and also, I'll start by saying a big thank you to um, Libby and Johannes, because this has been definitely a collaborative effort, <clears throat> and it's much better for it. Um, so what I want to do very quickly is sort of introduce the structure of the day, and then um, the presenters are going to introduce themselves, and then we'd just like to know a little bit more about you. Uh, one thing I do want to say is that this was originally planned to be a two-day in-person workshop, and I can assure you I would rather be in Cologne right now doing that than sat in the office I've been in for three months. Um, but we have made some changes accordingly because it's online, so it is one day now because we appreciate it. It's a lot to a lot of content to try to cram into one day. It's also we've although when things are online you can't entirely emulate the real world environment we have put lots of interaction in and lots of sort of group work in breakout rooms and we really want to encourage discussion you know, if this workshop is just us talking at you then it'll be over pretty quickly and it won't be that valuable for everyone so we really we really do want you to talk to us ask questions tell us your experiences um i guess one way to think about this workshop is a way of sharing best practice and we by no means assume that we know all the answers in fact a lot of the time we're asking questions for which the answer isn't known yet and who knows we might work it out together so thank you for coming <clears throat> thank you for making the time um you've got the timetable but the brief outline here follows um the the data life cycle as you'd expect the so planning collecting processing analyzing archive and sharing um, we're not talking about analysing today, it's there as a placeholder, just to show where it is. Um, but I believe there's a link to another course um, that has, that's put in there, if you're interested in analysing social media data in particular. Good. Okay. So, let's start with a few introductions. I'll start myself and then pass over to my co-presenters. So, yeah, who am I? Well... My background actually is in political science and local government elections in England. Um, and now I don't do anything to do with that substantively. But one of the things I guess I learned during my, my MSc and PhD study was about methods and new and innovative ways of thinking of things. So I've now been at Cardiff for almost 10 years. And I guess my research interests started off ooh, about five or six years ago thinking about whether Twitter data or social media data in general could tell us anything useful and meaningful about the social world. And it kind of transcended now more into data linkage. So specifically that if you want to know what Twitter can and can tell you about the social world, you kind of want to be able to calibrate and cross-reference it with another source in which we have more faith, such as surveys. So a lot of my stuff has been about the ethics and consent of linkage. I haven't actually got to the point where we've done much analysis we've only really done basic um looking at linkage data really <clears throat> and that's part of a big esrc project which i'll be leading on which has been delayed during coronavirus but will kick off later this year in earnest to actually analyze linked data properly um, but of course before you do that you've got to understand the data you've got to understand consent you've got to um have an appreciation of some very i say specific data security issues i mean uh, they're quite similar for if you were linking survey and admin data, but there are some things that are idiosyncratic about social media data um, that we'll go into later that you know, really need special consideration. Um, I guess the other thing to say is I'm also as with say handbook of social media research methods. So I, I, I guess I think of myself as having a, a broad interest across the methodological spectrum of how social media can be useful. Um, that's what I'm going to say. That I'm going to pass over to. Libby, now, Libby, I'll keep control of the slides, okay? Um, so when you're done, let me know and I'll skip on. Okay, thanks very much, Luke. Okay, well, you can see some recent work, but like Luke, I'll, I'll give you a thumbnail of the, the maverick history. So also like, like Luke, I took it, well, I took a PhD in economics at the University of California at Berkeley and then proceeded more or less to walk away from economics ever since, have never gone back to deal with it 
in any detail except to be eternally grateful that I know fundamentally what is wrong with neoclassical economics, having studied it from the inside. So it was well worth the effort. Um, after that, I actually got very interested in the qualitative data and did work with that for a number of years. And then migrated out of research into the realm of data archives and left U.S. in uh, 2003, it was, to go to work at the U.K. Data Archive for a number of years, largely focused with the issues around archiving data, got very interested in the debate about opening up data, how to open it, um, when it can and cannot be opened. Um, and I suppose it really is that very complicated debate between the values of open data and open science and yet commitment to uh, protecting privacy, concerns about disclosure, risk, and so forth that pushed me further into researching ethics, which I then have done in, in some more detail, um, including some formal uh, formal work at, at um, graduate level at, at ethics. Social media, I'll, I think it's probably just worth being honest that I have been reasonably skeptical that social media mattered much at all until fairly recently. <laughs> I'm um, of a generation, I suppose, that needs to be persuaded, definitely not digital native. Um, however, I will say that I think my attitude was changing pre-COVID and it has changed with COVID. I think what is happening in the online world now is so fundamental to social questions that we have to deal with it. And from a standpoint of an archivist, that means I have to think about what it means to hold this data replication, reproduction issues with, with managing the data and so forth. So that's um, how I've gotten to, um, to this talk, if you will. Okay, thanks, Luke. That's it. Okay. Uh, hello again for me. Um, my name is Hans Ployer. I work at GASIS and uh, my background is in uh, communication and psychology or media psychology to be a bit more specific. And in uh, my research, I, I mostly look at different uh, aspects of uses and effects of digital media. Other research interests are computational methods and uh, open science. And here at GASIS, my work uh, focuses on data linking. I'm also uh, working in a team that is called Data Linking and Data Security and working with digital trace data. Um, I'm trying to, going to try to keep it brief. Um, some of the publications that I've been working on uh, related to digital trace data, you can see here. And uh, if you want to find more about me and uh, my research, you can check out my website. Uh, thank you. So there's a range of experience, there is and a range of backgrounds. I guess what we all share is this interest in what is effectively an interdisciplinary challenge of what social, what social media is, what it can be used for, how it should be handled. <clears throat> um, so in a minute, I'm really interested to hear from the participants on what your backgrounds are as well. And once we know that, we can maybe start to move the workshop in particular directions if we know the particular things you want to get out of today. But overall, <clears throat> the key objectives are to understand why we might want to link survey and Twitter data and how to do it. Um, I guess a general awareness of the, the practical and the ethical challenges of linking survey and Twitter data. Um, we want to do some work around the disclosure risks that are very specific to, um, to linking this kind of data. And then some of the strategies around minimizing risk. Um, some of this might be familiar from uh, linking other types of work. Um, it's largely just an application of a lot of the stuff we already know, but some very specific idiosyncratic things around, for instance, JSON files and metadata that we really have to consider. All right. So the first uh, topical part of the session will be on uh, planning your research. And to start with, the first question, of course, um, we, we heard that people here have different backgrounds is with their knowledge also uh, of Twitter, Twitter data, whether people use Twitter or not themselves. Um, so, of course, one thing we keep in mind is that there's um, like Twitter data is not a monolithic thing. There are different types of Twitter data. Of course, the first thing that usually comes to mind is the textual data. So you have the tweets, retweets, and replies and the text or also images and videos that they can contain. But importantly, and also of interest, um, to, to both researchers and archivists is that you get a whole trove of metadata, <clears throat> for example, for the tweets. So you know how many reactions they got, at what time they were posted, uh, where they, you might know where, where they were posted and which language they were posted. Um, another popular type of Twitter data is network data. So you have uh, relationships between people. 
Um, so you can follow people and you can be followed. And already, if you know something about network data and or Twitter, um, you will know that, like, for example, unlike Facebook data, you have directed networks. So that's something that you always need to keep in mind. You can be followed by somebody, but you don't necessarily have to follow them them back. Uh, whereas on 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 Facebook, if there's a contact, it's a mutual contact. There's no um, um, two-way relationship, if you will. Um, and of course, Twitter. You, from Twitter, you can also get data about the user from their profile, for example, their self-description or bio, or uh, the number of followers that they have. And as always, like what type of data you need um, depends or uh, should depend on the specific research question that you have, whether you're, for example, interested in some specific user activity, interaction or networks, or exposure, which um, is somewhat more difficult to study, but we might talk about this later on when we talk about how you can actually collect the data and what the data can look like. Um, so this is an example. Uh, again, uh, we have uh, different pe people with different uh, experience with Twitter here. Uh, on the left, uh, this is uh, an example tweet from uh, Gesis. And you can already see on that image, you have some metadata here. You see when it was posted. You actually also see like through what platform it was posted. And you see here like how many reactions it uh, generated at that point in time. It includes hashtags. I guess everybody knows what those are. It includes a tag of uh, another user. And of course, text. And uh, in this case, also a link. Um, and if you look at the like the data that this uh, tweet is uh, produces or is stored in, which is a JSON file. I'm going to talk about that later on. Um, you already see that there's a bit more in here, right? You see, you can recognize the things that you already see in the screenshot from Twitter. You see the um, the timestamp, for example. Um, you see uh, the text, in this case, the truncated text. Um, you see the platform to which it was posted. But you can also see other things. For example, here you find some information about the user. Um, like you, you find the, the handle, you find the user ID, the user's location, description, etc. And those you could also, depending on like if you use the appropriate tool to open this uh, type of data, you can also enlarge that and see that um, here is a list of hashtags or a list of user mentions, <clears throat> which you can see here. So we're going to talk about the data structure in detail uh, a bit more later on, but this is just to like give you a very first impression of what, um, when we talk about Twitter data, what it could look like in this example if we talk about data for a specific tweet. Um, why is Twitter useful? Why can it be used for, for uh, social research? Um, we already know from quite a few studies that um, self-report data from surveys can be biased due to social desirability or problems with recollection. Um, and data from Twitter or other social media can provide behavioral data. So you see actual posts, comments, or reaction by the users. If you as a researcher are interested in studying the use of Twitter or social media, then using the data that um, this platform generates is much more reliable than self-reports. Just think of an example. I'm a media researcher. So if I ask you, assuming you use Twitter, how often you've logged onto Twitter today, you're going to be able to probably give me a good answer. <clears throat> if I ask you how often you logged onto Twitter last week, it's going to be a sort of a guesstimate, right? But you might still be precise depending on how, um, how often you use it, how frequently you use it. If I ask you how often you use it in an average week, it gets more difficult, right? What's an average week? And then you have all sorts of biases um, coming in. And even more so if I ask you about very specific types of behavior, even more so if those are types of behaviors that you rarely engage in. Like if I ask you how often have you in the last month or whatever time frame you want to use uh, retweeted content from a politician. This is, to be honest, in most cases, those are going to be fairly wild guesses. So if I have the objective data, sort of the ground truth on that, um, for uh, any sorts of media use or media effects research, that's quite valuable. But also, if you want to study something else, right, if um, you're not in interest, interested in media use per se, you can also use Twitter data to, for example, study the formation and expression of opinions and attitudes uh, on different subjects. Um, why is it a good idea to combine Twitter and survey data? Um, well, we've we just now talked about uh, some of the limitations of self-report data, but of course, social media data also have specific limitations. Um, while there are tools like M3, which is the, the tool that was um, promoted in the, the tweet that I just uh, showed you from Gases, um, 
to infer, well, you have self descriptions in the in the profile, for example, but this is very limited and it might be false. So that's another caveat. But there are tools which you can use to infer um, attributes of social media users, in this case, Twitter users, from their profile information. But again, this is like this machine learning based inf uh, inference, right? Um, so th this might also be wrong or it, the tool might not be able to um, <clears throat> infer anything about, at all based on, um, uh, depending on the type of data that's available. And another important thing is that relevant outcome variables are usually missing from social media data. For if you're a political scientist, one thing you are common though, people in political science commonly study is voting intention or, or voting behavior. And you don't, usually you don't see that from social media unless somebody for some reason publicly posts what they're going to vote for or what they have voted for, which might happen, uh, but certainly not very likely for most people. And if you combine um, Twitter and survey data, that's a, a good way to overcome the limitations of these two data sets. Or if you want to frame it more positively to combine the strength of those two data types. Um, if you want to collect and combine um, survey and Twitter data, there are essentially two ways, uh, sequences in which this can happen. You can start with survey data and then <clears throat> um, ask people for consent to also collect their Twitter data. And this is the, the procedure that we're going to focus on um, in this workshop. But of course, you could also first collect um, social media or Twitter data and then through social media, <clears throat> contact people and invite them <clears throat> to take your survey. Importantly, both of these options produce their own uh, sets uh, or come, come with their own sets of biases um, that they have. Um, and if you're interested in those, those types of biases, there's a really good paper by some of our colleagues from GASIS about where they apply the total survey error framework. Um, the people among you who uh, are interested or in survey methods or working in the area of survey methods are probably familiar with that. And they apply to digital trace data. Also, uh, one important distinction is that the data can come and also be linked on the individual level. So you have data for the, the same individuals um, that you can link on the individual level, or it can be aggregated. So you can have aggregated data for, for example, geographic regions or specific periods of time. Um, <clears throat> and another practical distinction that we tend to make is um, how the data collection um, works. So you can either collect the data together at the same time for the same people, which is what we would call ex-ante linking, or it can be combined from different sources at a later point in time. So um, ex post, that's what we would call ex-post linking. And um, <clears throat> essentially this means you take existing data, for example, from large survey programs and Twitter data collections, and then you combine them later on and you don't collect them together at the same time for the same individuals. Um, so, Note on the practicalities of survey Twitter data. Of course, if you combine different data sources, you always need a unique identifier or a combination thereof, different unique identifiers to be able to link to different data sets. Um, of course, the obvious choice for Twitter would be a person's screen name or handle, um, but there are some things that uh, should be kept in mind. Um, for example, for privacy reasons, the data should be stored separately and you need a, a process uh, for, for combining the data. And uh, Luke is gonna talk about that in detail um, later on. Uh, also, uh, I'm gonna give you an example from one of the studies that we did. Um, people might not know or remember their screen name, especially if they're very infrequent users and keep in mind that you can also log into Twitter with your email address. So again, especially if you're not a very frequent user, um, you just might not know or, or misremember your screen name. Um, also, usernames can be changed. So this, this matters, especially if you collect data through the API. Um, and I'm going to um, um, talk about this again later. But the user IDs, um, which um, you saw in the screenshot that I showed you, there was also a user ID for, in this case, cases.org. This remains stable. <clears throat> so for the account, the user ID will remain stable, but people can change their screen names. Um, if you ask people to provide their Twitter name in a survey, um, they might um, provide incorrect screen names. This can be done intentionally, right? Because they don't want, do they say they want you, <clears throat> they allow to uh, give you consent to track their Twitter activity, but then they decide other ways or they just want to troll the researchers. Uh, but also, of course, unintentionally. Again, they might misremember it um, or there might be a typo. Um, 
so you, you can't identify them. Um, one potential solution um, is that you could have people follow an account that you, uh, for example, create for your research project um, or send you a direct message for verification. But with direct message, you have to keep in mind that you need, they need to follow you and you um, also need to follow them. Um, and also one other limitation is that people um, have a protected account, right? You can set your, um, you can limit, you can view your posts, retweets, et cetera, on Twitter. And if you do that, and the account is what on Twitter is called protected, um, you cannot, at least not easily, and with most of the methods that I'm going to present later on, um, get data for those accounts. And I just mentioned that I wanted to give you a quick example from some of the work that, that I am involved in. <clears throat> and this is an internal research project here at GESIS that I did together with um, some colleagues from different departments here. Um, the starting point, which makes this a bit of a special case, <clears throat> was a web tracking panel. So we bought web tracking data that logs browser activity. Um, there's, a, there's a market research company that uh, maintains this panel of people who have their browser tra uh, traffic tracked, and it's roughly 2,000 people per month. And we have data from June 2018 to May 2019. Um, we also invited this uh, panelists to online surveys, um, three in total. And in the first one, we included quest questions about Twitter. We asked them whether they used Twitter, and then the Twitter users were asked whether they would consent to having their Twitter data Twitter activities tracked through the API, they received an additional incentive for that. Um, they were presented with a short informed consent in the questionnaire and then some extended privacy information on a website that was linked um, in the survey. And this was adapted um, uh, from work by, by Luke and his colleagues, which again, he will present in uh, detail later on, uh, including the actual um, consent text and questions that they, that they used. Um, so with how did this work? Um, we first had um, uh, the web checking panel and roughly 65% uh, from that panel completed the online survey. Um, but, but more than 20, or like roughly 23% uh, in that sample um, used Twitter, which is um, much higher than uh, like the general population in Germany, uh, where usually you have estimates on like the single digit percentage, certainly below 10% for the German population. So this is much higher. And this already gives you a hint that, of course, keep in mind, those are people who, to start with, consent to having their web tra uh, data tracked. And it was also opt-in. So we have all sorts of different biases at, at work in this sample. Um, from those users, 65% agreed to having their Twitter data tracked, which is also fairly high. I think Luke will... Um, uh, talk about some of the, the figures from, from his uh, work with representative studies in the UK, and, and this looks quite different. Um, so we had a high consent rate. <clears throat> um, 202 people said that we could track their Twitter activities. But then, and this is what I said before with the practicalities of linking, um, we had like a roughly 40% dropout even at that stage because we couldn't identify some of the accounts. In most cases, this was because people... Um, so there were like typos or actually, and this is why I stressed the point about the email address. People typed in their email address here because this is what they used um, to, uh, this is what they used to log into Twitter. They always type in their email address. So they typed in the email address as their Twitter handle. We had some cases where people obviously provided Twitter handles that weren't theirs. Um, and the rest was just like typo, missing letters, uh, something like that. I think we had, no, only very few protected accounts in that data set. But still, this is something to keep in mind that even after people consent, you can have data loss or dropout at this stage. Okay. So what, um, um, what are ethical issues that come up with, with social, social media? Well, as Johannes has already explained, we've got really a fundamental difference from the very starting point between things like social media and Twitter. Surveys, we collect them explicitly for research and teaching purposes. And for because of that, we got a bit more control over that process. But with social media, with uh, web scraping, these other kinds of, of, um, oper of ways of gathering data, the data, are, are, they are what I call wild. Um, they simply have not gone through the kind of nor normal, normal for social sciences processes of producing data for, for surveys. And therefore, a lot of the kinds of ethical um, safeguards, procedures, questions that, that come up haven't 
are, haven't happened and aren't, aren't applied. So in particular, things like informed consent, um, ideas about de-identification, anonymizing, aggregation, these aren't implemented, sometimes not even thought necessary for this kind of, of data. Um, why this matters, if you will, is because we are using data, um, if we're pulling it from social media, from other, um, other sources, we're using it in ways different from its original, original purpose. So, you know, users have their own reasons for posting on Facebook, uh, sending out tweets, um, surfing, uh, obviously, and now we are repurposing that material into, um, for research, uh, into research. And there's a fair bit of study, both from uh, some of Luke's own work, also from uh, Ipsos Mori, some other um, uh, market research organizations in, in the UK, that users are aware of this and sometimes actually quite critical of the idea of their material being moved from one domain to another um, without their explicit consent or without, uh, without anonymization of, of that material. So more generally, this is this idea, and you'll see this phrase used quite a bit with social media, of something that's called um, context collapse. And that's the idea that social media, these virtual uh, worlds, blur things together. They blur public and private. They blur original use, research use, archive and, uh, archiving and sharing. Um, and when, you, when a thing changes its context, the meaning of it changes. So my rosebud example, it's a pretty crude example. I want to come up with a quick one to make, make the point. Boyd, uh, Dana Boyd talks about this extensively in her older work, her new, new work too. But we have a great rose bush in our front garden. When it blooms in the spring, it's an object of conversation with my neighbors. They stop by, we look at the roses, we chat about them. The rose has a certain con meaning in that context of social interaction in the neighborhood. On Valentine's Day, when my husband cuts a rose, puts it in a vase and a single rose on the table, that rose takes on a very different meaning. Both are valid, both matter, um, but changing just the context changes the meaning of what's going on. And when data move context like this, the significance, what's going on can really change. And we have to pay attention to that when we think about what we're, what we're doing. So the final ethical, not final, but probably another major ethical issue with social media data are that they're, they're, pers they're often personal, and I do mean that in the literal sense of identifiable, people use real names, real information often, but really the trick is it's hard to assess how personal it is, how identifiable, and Luke is going to come back to that too, so I'm just kind of flagging that issue right now to start. Okay, but who is ethics? Um, ethics is a huge topic. I knew the, you know, I don't always know a great deal about ethics, but I do know the wrong way to start an ethics session is to go through three great theories about ethics and why they matter for social research. Um, but still, it, we have to pay a little bit of attention to, to where these questions come from. So obviously, if you're from the social sciences, what I put on that first slide is probably somewhat familiar. You're used to working with the idea of ethical review for human subjects. But as we've already made really clear, both by presentation and the group that's gathered here today, social media research and the new questions that are coming up draw why, across wide disciplines. So I'd be interested to hear from those of you in computing, but my experience has been in the US, UK, and to some extent here in, in Germany, that if you're coming out of a more what I would call pure, pure computing background, these questions don't necessarily come up. You're not, we not, may not even think about social media as human subjects data. In the U.S., under institutional review, if you don't have, sorry, institutional review boards, the formal review process in the U.S., if you don't have direct interaction with your participants, if the data are in some ways deemed public, that is um, out there for everyone to see, and if it's, if people are not, if individuals are not identifiable, it's not even classified as human subjects data in many cases and therefore goes through no, no ethical review. 
Other kinds of questions that are, are debated hotly in this realm is, is the setting public or private? Um, and this, these questions I'll come back to because we're going to, I think, discuss this a little bit um, just before noon. But how might we decide if the setting is public or private? Does it matter who tweeted? Um, does it matter what their intention was in doing that tweet? Platforms themselves have pretty different norms. The simple version is usually that Twitter, by and large, is a broadcast platform. That's what people are trying to do on Twitter. Facebook, a mm, bit of both, but certainly there are realms where Facebook groups are intended to be a, a private exclusive group. And for that matter, even if we agree that it's public, um, does that mean anything goes? Does that mean you can repurpose material as you see fit in research and in, in archiving and any other use? Maybe not. And again, Luke's done some great work in this area, um, but we can, we can rethink it. So to kind of drill down, um, the essence of ethics for me has got very little to do with a lot of formal theories. It certainly is not to do with um, tick the box kinds of exercises with, with getting through your projects through ethics review, if indeed you have to do that. It is about having some kind of reasoned debate on these conflicting moral claims. And that's, they are inevitable in the work that we're doing. Um, we can cite many, but the ones, the obvious ones that have come up are these commitments about openness. We're all working toward making our material more open, um, shareable, transparent um, for funders, for all sorts of, of people. Um, and just for the sake of the integrity of science, perhaps most importantly, but this comes with, with risks to um, potentially to individuals, even if not to individuals, possibly to groups. So that um, is a debate we have to deal with. So ethics for people who, especially people who come out of a, a fairly traditional positivist um, background is often uncomfortable. It, there are almost never black and white, yes, no kinds of answers, very few absolute rules, a lot of contextual thinking needs to be done, and that can be frustrating. So bear with me. I'd like to push on the discussion, but I hope we can um, agree that it's okay. Maybe that's the important thing. Agree it's okay to be frustrated and to um, fa realize that that's the, the nature of this kind of work. Okay, so let me turn now to a few more specifics um, and on consent and consent and linking specifically. So in one way, it's a bit easier if you're working with the realm of linking surveys with other kinds of data. Um, almost certainly, if I'd be interested again, if people know of exceptions, but it's fairly li very likely that you will have to go through some kind of consent procedure if you are working with linking with a major survey. Most of them already require linkage, uh, sorry, require consent, and you're going to be required to do that. Twitter also seems to require this. Um, that's an interesting debate I think we'll get to later in the day. To what extent can is what we're doing compliant with what Twitter says um, is, is necessary for, for linking. But just to make the uh, a, a point at the high level, getting consent is at least you know a two-step or three-step process if you want to think about it that way. Consent for the survey, consent for new data you're collecting, and consent for the linking itself. Those are three distinct um, uh, bits of consent that have to be achieved. Um, again, we'll, we'll work a detailed example, but you know, you must be doing consent on the general topics, what data is going to be collected, what kind of purpose, um, and how data is stored and, and accessing it. Uh, there are, of course, I'm not going to be covering the detailed legal stuff. I mean, incredibly grateful Oliver is here today. He can handle um, issues around GDPR far better than, than I can. But these t almost always ethics review boards, um, formal ethics review, say you must be complying with legal regulations as well. So the two intersect quite a bit. But the practical challenge is finding the balance. Um, if we talk, the goal of consent, of course, is to make sure that people are um, Usually the phrases is fully informed um, and explicit cons consent and to, to balance being fully informed at a detailed level with explicit consent and not overwhelming people with the linkage issues with the details that have to be explained when linking data is very, very challenging. Um, and again, we will be showing you some, I think, examples that have, have really gone a far way toward achieving that that goal. Okay, so we won't go into it so much today, but um, because we'll we'll focus on consent because that's the, the path most typical for for linking social media and um, uh, and surveys. However, 
many of you are working with social media more generally. You might not be linking it you, or you might be linking it in other ways. So I just want to comment briefly on the issue of how to think about um, ethics when you aren't going through or may not be required to go through formal con consent procedure. So again, the tricky bit with, with our kind of data is, you know, we're the, you know, the very thing that makes this data fantastic to work with is the fact that it's huge. We've already talked about you can accumulate, you can pool stuff, link many sources, but it's not existing in a little nice package like, you know, the results of a survey. Again, it's wild and it's it's messy. When consent, and so for those reasons, there are real challenges, technical, ethical fe feasibility when thinking about consent is not possible. Um, now, again, social sciences can be helpful here because we're so drilled to think that con consent is essential. It's worth remembering that there is a whole realm of literature about doing research without consent. It is not essential for social science research. Um, we could come back to that in the discussion, but it is a very high bar, I would say, to meet as to what um, of doing research with without without consent. So scale is a huge challenge. Um, you often simply cannot reach people for direct consent on Twitter. And of course, with um, using Twitter, you cannot reach people directly unless they're, they're following you. And so with, you can't private message um, and do consent that way. For small scale stuff, it often works. And a colleague of, of Luke's, Dan Gray, and I wrote a, a piece together on gaining consent, even for an incredibly um, difficult, contentious topic of hate speech, um, misogynist hate speech on Twitter, um, he had an extremely good success rate in getting people willing to um, let their material be used and quoted and so forth, even for some truly ghastly things that they were saying. But they gave consent, so you could argue that that could, could be done. Um, again, issues beyond um, con consent, this isn't going to be a technical day on, on anonymization and disclosure risk, but any issue with linkage, as we are aware, incre increases disclosure risk. Um, we're a little bit better about understanding the, the metrics, how to measure that within a more narrow survey do domain. There are um, ways to, to capture that. But when we're linking totally different kinds of data um, with, with mixes of, of types of variables, it's difficult to quantify. But again, the exercises later will um, give you at least some ideas about procedures for how to handle this, this measurement of, of disclosure risk. So what what to do? Um, well, when you're, and, and although a lot of research is, is indeed happening on social media, there is, there is a great deal more now. Um, the fact is there still is not, there certainly isn't consensus. We haven't had decades and decades of this kind of work to, to build agreement on how we do things. Um, more things are being published, of course, and that's great. There are a growing number of really good cases out there, and we have collected some literature for you in the, the Ilias area. But this is the one place where I will come back to kind of first principles, if you will, in, in ethical issues. There are many to choose from. You can look at other kinds of formal ethical theory, the original philosophers, but they're um, a, a pretty decent source is this Belmont report out of the, the U.S. So we'll provide a link link for that. But these core ideas about what did users attend, uh, intend originally? And this gets at the idea of you have to you know respect your users, respect the people who are contributing the data. What did they intend? Um, are you using stuff in ways they might agree with or, or not? Respecting their rights and their autonomy. And that's a key principle to think about. Um, a second one, obviously, is harm. Uh, we're, we're not in the realm of medical research where the harms can be extreme, like death. Nonetheless, especially with what we have seen happening with the polarization and um, implicit violence, things talked about on social media, there are serious risks of harm, certainly risks of reputational harm. So this idea of beneficence and paying attention to what, what damage we might do. And the final one is justice. Who benefits from the research? We do as researchers, of course, we think we do, um, but who can access this data? As you as the researcher, do you have obligations to um, share our results and or the data with your participants, with the wider research community? What are the kinds of duties and obligations that arise with, with these. So again, um, I'll talk a bit about some tools for, for doing this sort of stuff, but when you're grappling with, with questions, it's, it's sometimes good to have um, at least a, an outline of key principles to keep coming back to. Right, yes, so on to informed consent. Um, now, I've got an I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this backwards. I've got an activity at the end of this where I want you to think about informed consent and basically whether you think we achieved it. So 
I am not going to draw out some of the problems, some of the issues too much whilst I do this, because I don't want to um, kind of bias the conversation that's going to happen afterwards, but I will go back and recap. So what I want to talk through is basically um, a description of something that I was involved in in the UK with colleagues at um, the NATSEN Centre for Social Research and the Institute of Social Economic Research at the University of Essex. So in the UK, we have um, a big um, longitudinal study called um, Understanding Society. It used to be the British Household Panel Survey. And within that, there is a subset called the Innovation Panel. And this is like 1,000, 3,000 people who um, I say experimented on. That's not what I mean, but it's where you try new things about changing the order of questions, changing the mode of delivery, and, and seeing what happens. And we had an experiment authorised, ethically checked, just to ask people if they would consent to us linking their survey data to their Twitter data. So we didn't, I haven't actually done the analysis on the data, we were just interested in seeing who responded, who said yes, and what the response rates were going to look like. And the full details are in the paper there, which you can go and read, which my colleague Tarek um, was lead author on, including all the detailed numbers and the demographics behind who said yes and who didn't. There isn't that much difference actually demographic-wise. Um, not as big as you might think. Okay. So the trick with this was to design appropriate questions to gain informed consent. So you know, the principles of what are we going to do with your data? How is it going to be stored? How will we keep it safe? And we were stuck here between, so, so I mean, this is always, let, let's, just, let's just call it what it is. There's never truly informed consent. All informed consent, informed consent is bounded because we can't possibly communicate to a lay audience everything that we could possibly do with that data. Okay, so, so that, that's the starting point. So you have to find some, some middle ground where everybody's happy. So basically, there, there are a, a range of questions. First of all, do you have a Twitter account? Yes or no? That's the filtering question. And then a question for consent. So do you consent? following a lot of help screen information that tries to explain what we're doing with the data, and then asking for the Twitter username, which, as um, Johannes showed earlier, is, is problematic in itself. And actually, you know, a reasonable subset of Twitter usernames we were given were not obviously, um, not obviously given to us wrong to deceive us, but we just couldn't find. And of course, Twitter usernames change as well. So unless you do the linkage quite soon after you've done the collection, which is actually quite rare because of the amount of time it takes to process and clean the data, um, then you can lose people that way. Okay. So essentially, to ensure that we achieve four cons um, informed consent, there were four help screens that covered what information we'll collect, which is complicated, um, what the information will be used for, which is also complicated, who will be able to access the information, which is much more straightforward and not that different to what we would do normally within consent for surveys, and how we keep information safe, which has a little bit of complexity because of the linked data. So what I want to do is just show you the sorts of the sort of help text and the questions that we asked and highlight some very particular issues about Twitter data. So the first thing to say, if they said yes to the Twitter data, is this text that was read out to them by the interviewer. So we're very explicit that we want to be able to link survey and Twitter data. So we're making that, we're saying that up front. But very specifically, we're telling them what data we're interested in linking. So when people tweet, um, they might only think that we're interested in the text of the tweet. But there's a whole load of metadata, which we'll go into later, a whole load of other stuff that people don't realise they produce. So they may not realise that there is a location attached to their tweet. They won't necessarily realise that every time they tweet um, their description field, is reported as well. So you know, we get up to 150 pieces of information for each tweet, and people don't know that. So we want to make sure that people realise we're not collecting tweets, we're collecting their profile information and information about how they use their account, because within that metadata is information on the platform they used, um, whether it was from a mobile or not, you know, the time of day, and lots of behavioural stuff about how often they're tweeting as well. Um, and then the the idea that they will not be identified without explicit permission, which we'll come into later. So the first thing was trying to get across the complexity of Twitter data to users 
who probably don't understand it. Okay. And then we had a series of help screens that people could read. Okay. And there's a lot of information in here, but again, we're trying to tread a fine line between giving people what they need to make an informed decision without overburdening them with information. So I'm not going to read this out, but you can see I've highlighted and read the important bits. So the first one, we're only collecting Twitter data that is publicly available. Now, one of the things you might want to come back to, and I think it will come up later in relation to Libby's discussion, we're saying data that's publicly available. I don't think it necessarily follows that that data should be considered public without any restrictions. And we can, we can discuss that later, but that's how we described it to people. Um, we wanted to point out that content of tweets includes images, videos, and web links, not just text. Okay, so anything someone's tweeted, we could, we could um, collect. A really important one, and well, I should say, but before this, I asked a consent, I've asked design consent questions before, and we forgot to mention this, is that actually we're not asking to collect Twitter data from the point at which consent is given. Often we're asking to go back and mine their Twitter accounts and get historic data. Okay. So this is really interesting because it depends on if you think, if we ask someone whether we can link their survey to their Twitter data, is that going to impact on how they use Twitter? So the Hawthorne effect, you know, if people know that they're being observed, are they going to behave differently? No, we don't know that. And some of the stuff that uh, Johannes talked about earlier with people with browser extensions, I mean, I'm, I'm really skeptical because I know my behavior would change if I knew I was being watched, but maybe that's not the case for everyone. Um, so being able to go and mine past tweets up to the last 3,000 gets around that. But it's actually quite a big deal to ask someone, can we have, for most people, that's the entirety of your Twitter history. Because people are not going to go back and flip through and check everything they've said or done. So we really want to make it clear that we're going to get the historic stuff and then everything they do from this point on. Okay. If I was to ask anybody here to sort of just quickly recap across the whole of their social media history on a given platform, that's a, that's a big cognitive load. That's a big question to do. So not easy. Okay. So what would the information be used for? So I think that if you look at the bullet points down the bottom, understanding who uses Twitter and how they use it. So yes, basically describing uh, prevalence in the population, seeing whether use is gendered, whether it's based on age or particular socioeconomic classes, and it is to a lesser extent in, in the UK. Um, see what information Twitter can tell us about people, how accurate it is, suggest that there's some, cal some um, calibration going on between the survey and the data from the platform. And then we thought this was quite important. We wanted to explain to people that, because when you respond to a uh, question in a survey, you know what you're being asked about. So if you're being asked about attitudes towards ethnic minorities, Brexit, political parties, it's explicit. And what we're saying here is that when we link your Twitter data, we, we're going to use it to look at things that we might not have asked about on the survey. So we might not have asked you about your political, we might not have asked you about your political beliefs or who you follow, but we might be able to do that with Twitter data. So it's a catch-all term, but again, that covers pretty much anything we can want to do with it, and that may or may not be a problem. I think the who will be able to access the information is, um, is pretty straightforward. Bear in mind that the people answering this are already part of a large study. So I think there's a difference here um, between uh, a one-off single survey in which you're asked to link data and where you've got a cohort of people who are established and used to responding regularly to um, a panel survey. Some, incidentally, some related work that I did with colleagues on um, at University of Bristol, they, they got people in from um, ALSPAC, the Avon Longitudinal Study, um, and they've been in the co-op for ages, and these people are given like DNA samples and teeth and bio and swabs and all that. So when they were asked about whether they would be prepared to give their Twitter data, they said, really? I mean, that's nothing compared to what you've already got on me. Okay. So, so, and, and, but they had faith in the study to secure their data more broadly. So where there's an established relationship between the study and participants, where that trust already exists, you might find that consent is going to be higher and easier to obtain. That's important. So, you know, if they already have faith, haven't any breaches, then it will be fine. So 
We did want to, however, explain that there's a difference between the micro data which identifies you and the higher level aggregate statistical data which other people might be able to access. Um, without getting too ahead of what we'll talk about later, um, you know, we can think about different controlled settings for accessing different levels of microdata being sensitive or anonymized or not. And that goes back to, I think it was Sabine's point, wasn't it, about the richness of the data and the value of it being highly disclosive and highly secure, and then aggregating things and maybe having that under maybe a special license condition, but that you lose the richness of the data and then you question what you can actually do with it from an analytical perspective. So, you know, it's all linked together, we can come back to that. Um, and then, of course, what we do to keep information safe. Now, interestingly, this data was collected when in the UK we had the Data Protection Act because GDPR hadn't come in yet. Okay, so this is in response to Data Protection Act requirements. Um, so we wanted to point out that, and I think this is my stance, full stop, is that Twitter data um, is impossible to anon anonymize. Um, I don't agree with bricolage approaches to changing tweets or you know, algorithms for changing words. I, I think we should just start from the basis personally that it's, it's impossible to anonymize the basis at a micro level data. Okay. So what we wanted to do here was point out that actually being able to identify you from your tweets is no different to being able to identify you from your survey data. You know, that is possible and we treat that in a very secure way and we have very strict disclosure controls. So you trust us to do that, therefore we will treat your Twitter data with the same reverence, the same respect, the same data and security. Now, what that means in effect is that, because of what Libby said about the difficulties of understanding disclosure risks for Twitter data, is that actually nothing is ever going to be disclosed in relation to Twitter data until we are as certain and have the same knowledge base as we do for survey data, which means but we're promising a very high level of protection here, which at the moment equates to us not sharing or archiving anything until we're absolutely sure that we can obtain that high standard. Okay. And then once we go to all that, we've got the, you know, are you, be, are you prepared? Yes. And then a few soft checks to check in that the username is actually the username. So one of the things you have to talk about, about people logging in with their, email address, we have a soft check here to make sure that it begins with the at character to try and avoid that. But again, it's not, it's not perfect. If you want to collect social media data, and uh, Twitter data is a subtype of that, there are different ways of uh, getting that data. Um, in a paper that is in press together that, uh, by Libby, me, and uh, our colleague Katalina Kinderkolanda, we distinguished uh, three basic types of accessing social media data. You can collect the data yourself um, through the means of APIs, and this is what um, I'll be focus on, focusing on in the remainder of this part, um, or web scraping. You can cooperate with companies that, that hold or produce these data to gain privileged access, for example, as an embedded researcher, or you can purchase the data from data resellers um, or market research companies. Um, and of course, you don't need to necessarily always collect the data yourself. There are also existing large-scale social media data collections and Twitter data collections specifically out there, which you can um, reuse for your research as well. Um, as always, all of these options have their specific pros and cons. I'm not going to read all of them out, but essentially what you need to think of when you decide which option to go for or to keep in mind are the, the costs that they incur, um, the skill and effort that they require, um, the control that you have over the collected data, uh, what type of data you get, like how comprehensive and detailed the data is, and what you can do with the data in terms of <clears throat> data sharing and publication, and how independent your research is of the company um, that uh, owns the platform from which you want to collect or access data. And again, this is also laid out in more detail in the paper by Libby Catalina and me. Um, if you <clears throat> want to use an API, I guess all of you know that API stands for Application Programming Interface. And already in the name, what you can see is that's a system built for developers. So it's not originally meant for researchers. This is something that um, helps to keep in mind. 
Um, an API directly communicates with a database that's behind the service. This is what I tried to show here in the, in the figure. So you have a database that holds data that um, somehow is used by a service. <coughs> has a structured uh, vocabulary of que queries that you can send um, to get data. And it also controls what information is accessible to whom and in which, which quantity. So it's usually, even if you have API access, it's not completely open in a sense. Um, there are usually limitations um, to what you can do with an API. And if you use the API, you kind of, if you will, bypass um, the way through the HTML website and the uh, browser rendering, and as a user, <clears throat> in this case, um, as a researcher, you can directly interact with um, the database, or you can interact with the database through the API, it's probably more precise to say. If you go for web scraping, <clears throat> you would follow this path to collect your data, essentially. Um, Program on Web, which is a pretty good resource in general, they have a, also have a good definition of an API. And they say it's essentially the same thing as a user interface, except that it's geared for consumption by software instead of humans. Again and again, that's what I said before. It's something that you should keep in mind. APIs are not designed to be easily used by um, users, especially, and, and also not uh, researchers per se, um, but they can be used to collect data. And the Webster Program on Web has a good overview of all, um, not all, but many uh, available LP APIs from different services, including information about the Twitter APIs. Well, <clears throat> much of the research um, so far has been uh, relying on APIs to collect data, but um, there are some words of caution about APIs in order. They are offered by the platforms and sort of at will, which means that they can change or even completely close off APIs as they wish, because they, they own them, they're proprietary. Um, I think all of you are familiar with uh, what happened <clears throat> in this, uh, the wake of the so-called Cambridge Analytica scandal with Facebook. Essentially what they did is they closed off more or less the Graph API, which has been used also by researchers before. Some authors like Dean Freelon, um, um, for example, say that uh, research is now entering a post-API age and we have to think about alternatives to APIs and uh, Axel Boons um, call, even calls this an api collapse. Um, also, even if they're not closed off or severely reduced <coughs> by um, the platform owners, APIs have rate limits and they regulate uh, what data you can access and how often um, you can make certain requests. And these change. And they also change dr quite dramatically. I mean, I did the workshop before on uh, YouTube data. And um, it, over the last couple of years, YouTube, like I think the daily the limit for daily requests that you can um, um, send through the uh, free version of the API went from something around 50 million per day to 10,000 per day. And you can already think this is like, in terms of operations that you can do on the databases or in the, through the API, this is quite a substantial reduction. And they can just do it. When they decide they want to do it, um, they can do it because they, they own the services. Normally they have the courtesy of giving notifications to users. And if you've been using a specific version of the API, they um, usually have um, some moratorium or a time to make a transition. Um, but yeah, they can reduce or even close off any of the services um, as they wish. Um, and <clears throat> we've discussed this before as well. Not only the platforms have specific terms of services, but usually also the APIs have specific terms of services. And um, we're gonna discuss that in more detail um, in a later part of the workshop. Um, what data do you get from through an API? And again, I, uh, I'm assuming many of you already know this, that the most common format is JSON. Um, just here, I copied the Wikipedia definition. Uh, and JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Um, what's important to know about this, even if you have never really uh, seen the JSON file, is that it cons essentially consists of attribute value pairs. If you have some familiar familiarity with Python, for example, it's quite similar to a dictionary in Python. Um, if there are JSON files, you don't have to worry about them. You can easily explore them with any text editor, like for example, Notepad++ or Atom, but you can, you can even, you could open it in um, with, uh, what's the Windows thing called? Notepad, I think, uh, even though then the formatting is completely lost. Um, but there are some really neat browser extensions for Firefox and Chrome that you can use to explore JSON files. And also if you work with R and use R Studio, R Studio, R Studio also has some really nice options for um, exploring and working with JSON files. Um, specifically for Twitter JSON files, um, the documentation uh, for the Twitter API has a really good explanation of all the fields um, contained in JSON files for tweets. 
um, and all the data that, that those JSON files contain. Um, again, in many cases, in practice, you don't have to worry about this um, because many of the tools that I'm going to present in a bit take care of that for you, or it's fairly easy, for example, through a, a range of Python or R libraries to convert JSON to more common formats like CSV or put them just put them in the, the tabular data structure that uh, we as social scientists are most familiar with. Um, Twitter has uh, different APIs. Um, they provide quite detailed uh, documentation for those. Um, the REST API, um, Luke already mentioned this, can be used to collect information about user accounts, for example, their profile information or uh, number of followers, as well as a limited number of historical tweets, so tweets that they have, including retweets, etc., that they have uh, posted previously. Uh, currently, it's up to 3,200, but as I said, those um, parameters can change. Um, the streaming API allows you to collect data in real time. The free version of that API allows a collection of up to 1% of all tweets produced within 10 milliseconds of a request. And here you're already seeing the definition um, that it might be difficult to estimate whether your request will include all of the relevant tweets that you're interested in. Um, the only promise that, that Twitter sort of gives you is of the max. It's like you, you're not going to get more than this, but they don't say you're going to get at least this or you're going to get on average this. Um, they say that the, the sample is random, but there's been some really interesting research by uh, uh, computer scientists that shows that this is probably not really the case. So there is some systematic sampling, um, for example, time-based sampling at work. <clears throat> um, if you limit your uh, data collection with uh, filter parameters, like if you want to only collect data for specific accounts, which in the case of linking you probably will, or keywords or geographic reg regions, it's quite possible that you will get all relevant tweets, but unless you buy access to um, one of the, if you buy more privileged, uh, pay for more privileged API access to get like a 10% sample, for example, um, you'll really never know um, if you captured all relevant tweets. Um, as I said before, um, some researchers um, caution us that um, we need to think about alternatives to APIs for various reasons. Um, and one alternative that uh, Friedland, for example, um, uh, talks about in his paper is web scraping. Um, it's the, compared to API access, I think you can say it's the older method and it's been used before before there was a, a wide availability of APIs. Um, it is quite flexible and it's independent of API limitations. However, you get the, the data that you get um, from this approach is much more unstructured than uh, data that you get through APIs and JSON files. It's methodologically more challenging than you, uh, API access and most uh, platforms um, or the terms of services disallow it. Um, and another option is the data donation from users. Um, users can export their full Twitter archive and share it with researchers. But again, you already see here, the word archive appears here. So this means you would only get historical data in this case. Um, of course, one big plus of that is that um, you have a direct involvement of participants and it, you can be fairly transparent because they can explore their own data and see what they really share with you. Um, you're again independent of the, the API and its terms of services, but it's effort for the participants. You need to instruct them how to do it. Um, it takes some time to export it. It's usually not um, available as you click it because your archive might be large. So um, there's, there's effort involved for the participants and you need some solutions for actually securely receiving and processing the data. If they, they have to like share it with you somehow, they have to upload it somewhere. Um, so you need some solution for that. And of course also for processing data, which Luke will talk about later on. Um, there are many tools out there um, that you can use for collecting Twitter data. Um, a really good overview is the list that's curated by um, the Social Media Lab at Ryerson University, uh, the Social Media Research Toolkit. They provide a really good overview and I think it's uh, still being updated on a fairly frequent basis. Um, these tools differ in many regards. Some that might uh, be important for your choice of tool is whether they offer a graphical user interface, 
if they require programming skills, to, if they require API keys or a developer account, uh, the type of data that they collect and what, what functionalities they offer. For example, some can also be used for analysis, for example, for network analysis, whereas others are only there to uh, collect the data. Um, these are just some examples of tools, and this is quite subjective because these are tools that I have, uh, have worked with or um, tried out. Um, Cosmos is a tool that's actually developed in um, Luke's lab at Cardiff. Um, and again, as you see here, some of the uh, variables or qual uh, characteristics of the tools that are distinguished whether um, they have a graphical user interface, whether they require programming skills, and whether they need an API key. Interesting, um, there are some tools out there um, that um, allow you to collect quite a bit of data without the need to, to have a developer account or um, access token. Um, yeah, you can ex explore them later on. This is just the list of things that I have been working with and used, um, but there are dozens of other options out there that might be um, also suited to your needs. Hello. Processing, stage four. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Um, this has all worked out really nicely because now, regardless of what level you were working at there, um, you've got a feeling of what Twitter data looks like and the scale of it. Um, so we've got a lot of experience with, with survey data. We know its format. We know what it looks like. We've got protocols for cleaning it, for anonymizing it, for archiving, for sharing, whether something is secure access, special license access, or open. We've got all these frameworks in place. We don't have anything like that for Twitter data let alone for linked Twitter and um, survey data. So we need to think about how we honour the terms under which the survey data has been collected and apply it to Twitter. So, for example, surveys, most surveys promise some level of anonymity. So how do we maintain that? Um, you know, even if, and maybe I'm over worrying here, but even if you were to collect a survey and then give me a list of Usernames to collect the Twitter data. Even if I, my computer hasn't even come near the survey data, by issuing a collection, I'm still identifying people that are in that st survey sample. Now, that may or may not matter for those on cohort studies. It might matter if your survey is on something sensitive, such as I don't know, sexual practice and diseases, or if you're doing a survey of, um, I don't know. Atti atti I don't know, attitudes towards racism, something like that, identifying these people this way might in itself be problematic. So we have to, even before the data is linked, we need to think about where the processing, where the collection is actually going to be taking place. Um, often in the past, we've been in a situation where someone has collected the survey data and then it's been passed to us at Cardiff to collect the Twitter data with the understanding that that's fine, but you know that we still have strict protocols in place as to what conditions the Twitter data can be collected. I certainly wouldn't do it on a personal machine, for instance. Um, and the other problem is that Twitter data is highly disclosive, okay? There are lots of things in a survey which could be released accidentally, which wouldn't allow you to identify an individual because they are not unique. Okay? So, for instance, we tend even in, in most surveys, don't really ask for income to the closest pound. We ask them to put themselves in brackets. You know, we don't ask for their exact address, you might ask for a postcode sector. But there are lots of opportunities in Twitter for things to be unique and lots of combinations of things to be unique as well. Um, so we understand what Twitter data is now, what it looks like. We've got a little idea on how the API works. We now understand what a JSON is and it's going to have everything in there from the tweet to the background colour to the number of followers, the number of followees, and very specifically, the exact to the second time and date that this data item was created. So over 150 possible attributes can be associated with a single tweet. Um, and what I want to do now, without going, I know you can see the presentation, so don't go ahead to the next slides because they've got the answers on, is I want you to get you to think about these fields in isolation and whether they're going to be disclosive. So if I had this field in a JSON file, would this allow me to identify an individual user? What is the disclosure potential of this? Okay, so the basic principle is that, yeah, Twitter data is disclosive. Whatever field you have, you should, you know, 
unless you're the only there would be no point in linking data to the fields that are so mundane that they don't actually tell you anything about the individuals so all linked data should be treated as disclosive would be my stance i mean i don't think i don't think that's particularly contentious so there are some basic principles for maintaining security which are actually not that different for any linked data study you do it with admin data or government data anything which is firstly to keep the two data sources separate until they absolutely need to be linked and where that's done you do it in a secure environment um, and that's like the idea of data reduction that if you do have to link the data sources you only take the variables from the survey data and the twitter data that you're interested in to reduce the possibility of disclosure so you don't just link everything all in one place if you don't need to um, obviously you control access so a disclosive data for me i'm sure you all experience of working in data silos and secure data rooms um, probably not take it off site it's hard to imagine how data could be used through a, a less rigorous way depending on how you were to aggregate it that's what we'll move on to later i'll say deletion you know you you hold it for as long as you do and you certainly decouple the data when you've finished with it i'm not going to read through all that in detail because i'm you know I'm sure you can go through it in your own time so I mean, here's a here's an example of a flow chart which I'll talk you through, which we've used in the past. So step one, you've got your unique ID, your random ID assigned to the case. You've got your Twitter handle and your survey data, and then you split them. So number two is a unique ID in the Twitter handle, and stage three is a unique ID in the survey data. And basically, you go around to four, get your Twitter data, and then you remove the handle. So you're using the unique ID, which is presumably randomized as the key to link the two data sets so when you do link them back together you've lost the handle but of course in data set six you know depending on what the twitter derived variables are will determine as to whether that's still disclosive or not you know between points five and six moving from the raw twitter data in the json format to whatever you add to the survey data that you know that's where the that's where the problems might occur depending on what you do and don't decide to do So, so it's come up a couple of times already is an obvious way to reduce the risk of disclosure is to use some of the measures, some of the measures we already use in more conventional research, which is to not ask for more granular data than we need, or used to take data which was recorded at a very granular level and to aggregate it. So yes, we may ask for income in, pound, in pounds or euros, but we would almost certainly then, you know, if we were to share that data for analysis, put it into income groups we might ask for weights or heights or other things but we'll sort of collapse them down into groups we might record someone's exact postcode when we're doing a survey but we might share the city region that they were in if we were breaking it down so the question becomes if you think of all that twitter data is there an optimal elegant solution a selection of aggregate measures we could use and share safely that would not risk disclosing an individual and that's that's quite tough uh, for lots of reasons so for example there, there's lots of tools to pull out latent variables so we could we could take a load of tweets from someone and we give them scores based on anxiety depression happiness ego any number of things you want tools already exist out there to allocate those kinds of scores um but would we as researchers be happy consuming that for our analysis without understanding how it's been put together does it matter if say we're doing this for johannes and he's got 10 tweets and he do it for me and i've got 200 tweets so therefore does that make my scores more reliable or less reliable you know how do we record the massive differential in kind of the amount of raw data that's being used to produce these metrics um, putting users into groups, deciles, is a good idea. So, for example, if we're interested in the number of followers, we can just split it into 10 equally sized groups. But there's going to be one group, which is good, like the top follower group, which is going to be between 3,000 and 20 million. And it's going to have massive heterogeneity at the far end because, you know, the top 10% of users covers a wide range. So how do you deal with extreme value? Should you actually maybe log some of this? And then recode it. Think of those those issues. 
You could introduce jitter or random error, which is easier said than done. You could try and, um, for things like number of followers and number of tweets, you can introduce random error in such a way, impute it, that it doesn't change the overall shape of the sample, but that's difficult and problematic, and I, I have views on that, which uh, so I suspect the views on that depend on the discipline, actually, as to whether you like that. I think it's making it up, but I can understand why you might use it. <laughs> um, and you can aggregate to higher geographies for geographical level data as well. So, um, yes, sticking with our, our sort of data life cycle, um, I can tell you ours is, uh, analysis is the shortest section of all, so let me jump, jump ahead. Um, we're really not going to talk about it at all. Of course, it's a huge topic, um, and that means it has to be for another day. If you want to know about analyzing Twitter data, you, there is yet another GESIS workshop on that topic, um, and probably more to come in other, other places, but that will be, be it. So we're going to turn now to archiving and, and sharing. And I'm going to start really, I hope, from the top with kind of why, why think about archiving Twitter, quite frankly, why think about archiving any, any data at, at all. And I'm aware that um, in part because in, um, in the UK, where, as I mentioned, I worked for a number of years, the idea of, of archiving quite a number of years ago actually became first a strong recommendation and then actually a requirement from funders to, to do. So the idea was around for quite a, a, a bit longer time. That is much less true really anywhere else in the world, um, across Europe, Germany, even the, the US, uh, this, this idea is, is somewhat less. But I want to, um, I mean, often when I used to teach, and, and Oliver still does, but you know, we teach in, in any number of um, data management workshops, um, good reasons to archive and, and, and so forth. There's a set of uh, good practical reasons for doing it. We talk, and we've, these issues have come up here. We've talked about issues of reproducibility and, and openness. They're the fair principles for stewardship of sci scientific data, data findable, accessible, interoperable, and, and reusable. These are all noble goals, and I admire them, and we teach on them and, and, and try to follow them. But to be really honest, this is not what motivates me about archiving data at all <laughs> anymore. <laughs> what motivates me and scares me about archiving data is the little clip that I put in here, which is decaying trust in science. Um, and when I see what is happening in the world with the decline in trust in experts, particularly now, of course, in medical experts, but even we've seen it in, um, you know, the huge issues in reproducibility and the psychology data. A number of you are um, psychologists and are working in that area and I su assume are, are familiar with that. I, this, this is where I get concerned. And I also think it is, uh, I'm going to just jump in and, and say, say it here too, that, um, we we talk about the issue of you know do we archive it for re, re, um, reproducibility um, re replication that sort of thing we all know very few studies of actual replication are done it's a tiny tiny number um, there are really good reasons for that publishers aren't excited about them researchers aren't doing them they don't advance careers in the way that. Um, other kinds of research does all of that is is true. Um, I still think, however, the, the principle of the possibility of reproducibility is the key thing that matters, and that's why the uh, the openness, the ability to open and share data, um, to me is is a relevant dis discussion to have, and and is partly an ethical issue at, as, as well. So it's true for for me because of my interest in 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 ethics, um, I tend to, to perhaps impose that framework or these ideas behind even what seem like kind of mundane topics like publishing and, and sharing and, and archiving data, but I think they have ethical dimensions, and so that's why I um, uh, kind of raise the raise the, the the two issues um, the two issues t together. Um, I'm not going to read the the quote below. Most of you will know Dana Boyd's um, research. I, and I apologize. I know that should be a lowercase b, but I'll uh, fix that in the final version. It's just interesting to me that in in all the things that she talks about as being exactly the stuff that makes the, the digital world interesting to study, if you will, persistence, replicability, uh, searchability, and so forth. These are exactly the same principles most archives have in their mission statement. <laughs> it's really exactly the same list. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, a, of overlap in, in, in uh, those, those two. Um, okay, 
Now I'm going to jump in, down into some pretty nitty gritty stuff, if you if you will. Um, and I hope that that there's there's always a trade off in doing these these ethics stuff. I wanted to raise the top level, uh, the high level topics and um, general principles and stuff when I first first spoke, because I think there's some useful common ground. But this you know, the workshop is specifically on on linking. We're dealing with Twitter, and I think in order to quite frankly, maybe for all of us to have enough energy to summon for a, a, a good final push for a last discussion. I think we're going to have to get our teeth into something specific. Um, and so I, I really do want to, to look at uh, this, this issue about, about Twitter. Um, so what are some of the challenges in archiving Twitter, Twitter data? Um, and I will do just a, a little bit of, of background, but not, not much. As I said before, archiving this uh, Twitter is really, really new. I mean, in, in very short number of years, single digit numbers of years, I think, honestly. Um, a bit in the UK, a bit in at Gesis, um, not so much in any other European data archives. It's starting, but there isn't much. And ICPSR, the big data, social science data archive in the US, has a, a growing, rapidly growing capability in that. So it is happening, but it's it's new. Um, and because you know we are our, we are archives, um, we tend to be conservative by nature. It's what we do. We literally are conservative. We are also politically conservative. I don't mean right right wing, but I do mean we're uh, cautious. I really do mean conservative. What I mean here is cautious and extremely risk averse. Okay, and it, as institutions, at some level, we have to be for the data we hold in order for depositors to trust us. We have to be seen as good actors in the world. Um, and all this has pushed archives in taking what I would call a pretty um, legalistic, narrow, safe path in terms of thinking about this data. And there are good reasons for having done that. Um, and of course, I'm looking at Oliver's little square on the box, knowing that there are very good legal reasons. And there are reasons that institutions have to be careful in this area. It's the same way. I've, I've also sat on research ethics boards, um, and a lot of researchers I know hate them and see that they simply get in the way and cause more, more trouble. Um, research ethics boards can do that, it's quite true, but they do also have some responsibility to protect the larger institution. It's what they do. And so th this is the challenge with ethics in trying to look at these really difficult dilemmas from these multiple perspectives. And so I'm kind of putting the archive view out there because it's it's one to, um, that research, most researchers don't have. You'll have your view as, as researchers. Um, so I was, you know, I would say sort of tootling along, fairly comfortable with my fairly risk averse approach to, to data. Um, and I read Justin Littman's blog on Medium down here about, which is essentially a reinterpretation of Twitter's terms and conditions that is far more um, liberal, flexible, and some would say too loose an interpretation of what can be done with, with Twitter material. And I won't say I agree with everything, although I agree with quite a bit of it, but I will say it, it in a sense it opened my eyes to realizing that um, it is one can can be cautious and risk averse and still look at terms of service critically and not simply accept them as given perhaps um, and i'm fully aware that there may be serious legal consequences of crossing those lines but these are open questions now that i think we should debate and not simply take as assumptions so that's where i'm coming from um, from coming from on on this topic Okay, but just so we're on the same page, and, and for those of you who didn't, like I did, for example, spend Sunday afternoon rereading the Twitter developer policy to make sure that it was top of mind. Um, <laughs> so, um, and it is, you know, I have to say it is, is pr pr pretty interesting. Um, so, Luke, so, Luke is, you know, some of these topics have come up. I won't try, won't to drag out anything longer that we've already covered, but express an informed consent for republishing content if you're not going through, you know, the, the API. So even small scale qualitative study, I just want to republish the quotes of a couple of tweets. Um, do I, do I technically need consent if I'm legally following, um, if I'm going to follow a strict interpretation of Twitter's terms and conditions, maintaining integrity of Twitter content. Most of the time, most archives, again, are interpreting this as you don't change anything, meaning you do not remove identifiers, you do not do anonymization, you don't 
um, alter content. Now, I'm kind of in Luke's camp that I think that in most cases, if you're altering content enough to change identification, in many cases, you're reducing the real value of the data. And that's, uh, that's partly because I've got so much background in qualitative data where that's often true. Um, I don't find that t tinkering with content is, is really the best way to handle um, uh, anonymization and de-identification. But the point is Twitter wouldn't let you do it even if you wanted to go down that path. Okay. Um, Luke already mentioned the, this issue of deletion, and most of you are, pro are, are probably already familiar with it, so I, I won't dwell on it. But, but for archives, it is, it is a real challenge, okay? So if you store content offline, which would include, obviously, if you handed over a Twitter collection to, to an archive, it has to be kept up to date. So honestly, at the moment, the archives that I've worked with, if no, for no other reason, on a simplistic financial basis of not having the wherewithal to maintain um, active accounts and be updating and checking Twitter accounts, we can't. We can't do it. We simply cannot archive the the material in such a way where we would have to be continually checking it. So I'll come back to the solution, um, but you, probably, you already know, probably know what what it is. This final point is the challenge is if you again handing. Twitter content to third parties, you may only distribute tweet IDs. Well, this is the point where I really got hooked from Justin Littman because just, uh, archives have been interpreting this, the, the interpretation of third parties pretty narrowly, meaning more or less handing over to an archive counted as, th as third party. Um, Justin, who's at uh, University, is it Washington University? Can't remember, big, fairly big one in, in the US, um, is interpreting third party really quite widely to include um, all researchers, potentially their collaborators, and it might even include others um, beyond. So that's an interesting um, stretch. I'll, I think I'll be coming back to, to that in a, in a minute. Um, okay, so where does that leave us? What are archives actually doing? Well, we've mentioned this, so I won't spend much, much time on it, but this is, this is it. You get a metadata record, a um, couple of examples, one from GESIS, one from the UK Data Archive, and you get either nothing more than tweet ID and user ID, or you get a little bit of the metadata we've seen from, from JSON, um, but not necessarily very, very much more. So it's, um, it's a solution, sort of. I'll come back, come back to that. Um, now another, we've been alluding to access controls, but again, for those of you who aren't so familiar with the archiving, I do want to be clear that everyone understands what, what's going on. This is another um, tool, I would say, that archives are using to be able to ha handle and, and um, archive Twitter material. This is the geotag Twitter post ones that I, I think Johannes mentioned earlier also. So again, not much is archived. It's the tweet content, only IDs. In this case, however, though, it's some, it is even more restricted than that. Um, but because it, it was not possible to gain consent for this data and because there is still um, a re-identification risk because of the geo information included in this collection, the researchers opted for, again, this quite risk averse, quite conservative, and in this case, I'm gonna say also appropriate solution um, to place an even further restriction on access and the data are only ava available um, by request. You don't simply get access to the data by um, registering with, with thesis and going to to look at the data. Um, this is imperfect, like all these solutions are. It, I think, goes a very long way towards satisfying the FAIR standards. The data are findable. They are preserved, of course, as is standard in archives with, with DOI. Um, and an important contribution here is they're also reproducible because the additional information to do the rehydration is provided with the Python scripts, the tools, and extensive documentation. I, I will say, my, do my little plug, this is often not the case in stuff you find stored um, but not archived at places like GitHub. So this is an important difference about what um, benefits an archive might, might offer. I believe this meets a kind of F, a standard. This is the standard phrase out of a lot of the OECD and e, EU guidance. We're trying to make data as open as possible but closed when necessary. Um, a lot of judgment required here about, of course, what necessary means, but we're, we're, we're trying. Okay, so these are solutions, um, and but there's a lot of debate happening in the in the community and the archiving, and to some extent publishing. I'm kind of blurring these two a little bit. Um, the issues are similar, but not not 
totally the same. We could talk about that in the discussion a bit if you wish. So it's a solution, but but I will say I don't think for any of us, not those of us as researchers, Luke's talking about the frustration of trying to find a way to archive his material. As an archivist, this is not entirely satisfactory either. Um, Consent, of course, it's the gold standard for research. We'd all love to to do it, but we've seen what happens with consent rates dropping. Um, and when you don't have a great longitudinal study with great relationships with your participants, those consent rates drop even faster. It's not good. Um, IDs do not meet a standard of replication. There's just no way. It simply does not. Um, 30 to 80 percent persistence rate may be really bad. That seemed high even to me, but it's what um, this, this researcher Zubiega found in one assessment of persistence of Twitter, Twitter data sets. Um, the third party issue I already, um, I think I, I raised, but there's, there's a lot of ambiguity. If you interpret that relatively narrowly, it really means that the data set will, um, you know, could be um, transferred to, to an archive, but maybe you use a much more um, flexible in, interpretation. Maybe an institution like I, ICPSR or, or DSIS should talk to Twitter about archiving bigger chunks of stuff. These are interesting debates I think we should, um, we can consider. Um, again, in terms of, since we, we've been talking a lot on the side of um, things to do, like to manipulate the data to, to make it safer, doing the risk assessments of the individual variables, if you will, in, in, in JSON. Do we really have to treat the risk of all tweets the same um, for a public figure using, you know, a public tweet, somebody mentioned, you know, Trump's account, somebody else. Do we really think that that has to be treated with the same degree of sen sensitivity as someone else's, uh, you know, private discussions on hate speech or, or something like that? Okay. Um, so the other point that's come up in terms of, you know, getting, getting around these problems has been, well, what if you collaborate with the platforms? What if you, um, as I, uh, okay, uh, joke, joke alert, you know, go over to the dark side, um, join up with Facebook, join up with Twitter, um, and get your data there. You probably can do almost everything. Well, maybe not everything. You can do a lot more with your research. There's no doubt of that. You get a, incredible kinds of, of access. Um, you probably can publish with some restrictions. Maybe not. That's kind of ambiguous in terms of what we're seeing out there. Um, almost certainly you will not be able to open up that data very much, either for publication or for archiving. Is that ethical? Is it okay to publish something where you've gotten privileged access and then can't um, can't share it in any way, even if somebody asks for it for for replication? So this is the the Bruns and Pushman um, debate, and I strongly recommend people look into it. It's I think a little too big for us, and in, in, unless we want to choose to focus on that for the uh, our remaining time today, but um, it, it's the whole debate about social science one and the creation of a kind of elite, um, largely U.S. I would say based group of researchers with with special access to um, to Facebook. Okay, and made the point already that these solutions are so temporary because all Twitter or Facebook have to do is change their terms and conditions, which they do, um, and tell you, you today you can archive a million and tomorrow you can't archive a million and we're messed up again. So it, it's a, a very difficult situation for, for folks to, to be in. Okay, um, I'm not going to speak um, much to this slide right now, because at the moment, yep, I'm just about where I want it to be on time. It's 20 past. I um, want to highlight two or three topics that we can talk about in a short, dis <clears throat> excuse me, in a short discussion section after this. And um, I th don't think I'll do breakout groups at this time, because I'm, to be honest, I'm afraid that people might tune out a little bit and it's a little harder to maybe to focus in breakout group than if we stay, if we stay together as a, a group. And also if we finish earlier, um, if groups wrap up earlier, we certainly don't want to keep anybody later than, um, than necessary. So what I want to do, um, this isn't quite the exercise yet, but this, this actually could be an exercise. Um, this, we covered this a little bit, but this is, you know, when, what Twitter actually puts in its terms and conditions about what you can and can't do when you do off Twitter matching, which is what we're talking about with linking, you combining it with, with any other, any other data. So uh, again, like Luke did earlier, I've highlighted some, some key bits. Um, I think the two parts that are the most, most relevant perhaps for a conversation would be getting express opt-in and consent 
and this very vague um, get out of jail free clause about, you know, only based on information that someone would reasonably expect to be used for that purpose. That doesn't help very much, doesn't tell you, but the more guidance is that, you know, you have to have this information either provided directly to you or it has to be public data. So I think that the debate we could have as a, a group would be is, you know, is what we're doing actually even compliant with Twitter's strict, a strict interpretation of Twitter's guidance, and if it is or is not, does that matter? We, oh, well, actually, I would say it would matter either way. Um, if it does not matter, how do we justify that? And how do we justify that if we're called out by somebody, our ethics commissions or you know deans of our departments or anything like that, and to justify what it is we're we're doing? Okay, thank you, everybody. This was our workshop on linking Twitter and survey data. Um, first of all, of course, um, thanks to uh, the other two instructors, um, Luke Slow and Libby Bishop. Uh, thanks to all of uh, the participants who are here and engaged in the discussion. We really appreciate that. And we also very much appreciate the free uh, and open source tools for Twitter data collection that we presented. Um, and one thing that's near and dear to my heart is if you use any of those packages or any other academic open software for your research, uh, please cite them because we all know like currency in academia is citations. Um, and um, so you should, because people spend a lot, uh, a large amount of uh, time working on those packages in their free time some sometimes um, with without or with a very limited resources. So it's important that you give credit where credit is due. Um, if you use R, there's even a function that's simply called citation and then the parameter is the package name. And there's even, as always, it's like kind of like the, I don't know if you know the Sesame Street song, there's an app for that. In R, it's there's a package for that. Um, there's even the package called Grateful, which lets you automatically produce a reference list of the art of the packages that you've that you've been using in different types of formats and uh, as we said in the beginning this workshop is supported by SESTA the consortium of european social science data archives um, as part of its work plan 2020 work plan new data types and we're also grateful um, for the support and funding from SESTA and which also allows us to later on make different materials and recording of this workshop available to everybody so thanks again and um, hope to see you again soon. This video is produced by the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. For more information on SESTA, please visit www.sesta.eu.